Hebrews 2, verse 1 to 4. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience, see the just recompense of the word, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. Verse 4, God also bearing in witness both the signs and wonders, diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. So, um, so far, we've been able to look at man, the object of salvation, what happens to the sinner at salvation, what role does God play? Does God decree things to happen and they happen? Does predestination, what does it mean in Bible terms? If sin foreknowledge, election, so on and so forth. The will of God, the purpose of God, the hardening of hearts, Israel, Gentiles, Jews, Jacob, Esau, Ishmael, uh, uh, Ishmael Isaac, Abraham. We have seen different people at different times of human history and seen how God deals with humanity. We've seen how God, um, in his sovereignty as it is, he sovereignly gave man autonomy. And that's obvious from the point of birth, even to the point of grace when a man is saved, and even to the point of disobedience and rebellion. God still leaves the man. The man who is born again also has his own will in place, as the case may be. So, an important aspect of salvation, which is a personal thing, and um, what this particular session is, both personal and also good for a teacher of the word. I mentioned this earlier on, that one of the things that I didn't learn when I uh, first got saved, I never understood the meaning of assurance of salvation. What assures me that I am saved? So many, uh, it got to a point, I think it, it was not a case of what the brethren say. At the point, what do I say? At the point, even my dreams began to either assure me or let me know how unassured I should be. So it's an important, uh, uh, someone said, what, when, when someone is born again, what's the first thing he taught? I suggest assurance of salvation so that from that point, he begins to know his Lord and knows his Lord accurately. I love to recollect the song by a man, by a believer by the name of Fanny Crosby, who composed the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And you, the song is such a blessing to see that, I mean, uh, the assurance of a believer's salvation you know, comes from the person of Jesus. Like we said, some say, well, you can't be sure. They say God has chosen some people to be saved. You can't even be sure that you are among those who are saved. They say those who are elect are ultimately saved. You know, but you don't know until the end. Because those elect don't lose their salvation. While you are thinking, you are confused. You get to another one, they say, well, you can only be sure of your salvation now. You are not even sure in the future. So not, none of the two sides gives you any form of assurance. They create fear and doubt in your mind. Even the Catholics preach something similar. They even say the Pope is not even sure what a practice. is not even sure of the salvation. So, like I said earlier, when a believer does not have an assurance of salvation, then all the scriptures that teach against anxiety, doubt, and fear are irrelevant. Because already that lack of assurance will create doubt and fear and uncertainty. There has to be certainty in the Christian life. There has to be certainty to what we have believed. Hebrews 11.1 1 is his faith, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things of snow sin. 
if people before Jesus came had assurance, they had absolute assurance. You see how they spoke with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. You see how they spoke. They had absolute assurance. It's a faith is a substance of things old for and the evidence of things not seen. There are people sometimes that lack assurance. Circumstances of life sometimes interfere, you know, in what we do and how we do them and affect our assurance. Let me give you an example of someone. I know you have made fun of him. Because when someone lacks that assurance, he may actually be like an unbeliever. Not like an unbeliever, the kind of doubts you will have. There was a man in the Bible who, you know, in fact, he pointed Jesus out and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. And his own disciples followed Jesus. This is a man who had an heavenly encounter and saw the Lamb of God in as clear as possible in the vision. But in Matthew 11, he was in prison. And he says in verse 3, As thou he that should come, or should we look for another? Apparently, offenses are set in. In fact, Jesus actually commended him and said that, you know, among men that are born, no one has risen greater than John the Baptist, not so that he is the greatest in the kingdom is. Listen, the kingdom is greater than he. Jesus commended him. And John, from what Paul said and what the Bible teaches, of course, was a believer, no doubt about that. But you can see in his conduct, he lacks assurance because of circumstances. Are you the one to come? Or should we expect another? Those are words of, you know, lack of assurance. In, in so circumstances sometimes want to overwhelm us and we begin to have a problem sometimes by like what we do or what others do you find John writing why would John write? he says these things have I written unto you First John 5.13 that you may know that you will have eternal life so he was writing and that's that's what he was writing to further give assurance of the conviction that we all have. That's why I was saying by the book of Hebrews that the writer was convincing the unconvinced, was assuring the convinced, and was warning the rebellious in that material. So there is that assurance where, you know, we, we, John said, I write this thing that you may know. There's also a subjective assurance. Where the believer, and it's, it's important to see, and I must mention this, that when it comes to the assurance of salvation, you have a part to play. Don't see, don't expect a supernatural assurance of salvation. You have a part to play. There are things we do that make us lack that confidence about our salvation. It comes from things we expose ourselves to. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and then verse 10. I'm probably going to talk about this again. Wherefore, the rather, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That word there is confirmed, assured. If you do these things, you shall not stumble. So that's a, something, they say, you be diligent. That's a, there's a diligence that... Helps, as it were, the assurance of your salvation. A diligence. I will look at that later. That word assurance is a Greek word. Pleurophoria. P-L-E-R-O. I mentioned it before. P-H-O-R-I-A. Pleurophoria. It means full assurance. Full, that is, a full satisfaction. A full conviction. In First Thessalonians 1 5. For our gospel came not unto you word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. Use the word there, much assurance. He has the word much assurance, that means much full assurance. Koile in the Greek, P O I L E, 
much full assurance. In Colossians 2 and verse 2, that their hearts be meted by being comforted, being meted together in love into all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Hebrews 6, 11. The same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Hebrews 10, 32. Cast away not your confidence. 36, I meant. 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which had great... No, no, Hebrews 10, 22, I wanted to say. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. In full assurance. Every time you read the word assurance, you find words like eagerness, diligence, attain unto, draw near. That means your conduct is important. You have the responsibility in the assurance of your salvation. To be confident, to be satisfied, to be rest assured. Nobody will do it for you. You have a full responsibility in that regard. Martin Luther said this. He said, feelings are fickle. You cannot rely on your feelings to test your salvation. So, feelings are the most disqualified tests for salvation. So, where lies the salvation? What does the Bible teach? Number one basis of my salvation. Someone asked me a question. He said, how important, I was in you that day. He said, how important is the deity of Jesus Christ to me? I said, if you can contradict it and satisfactorily dispute, dis, dispute it, then everything is gone. Everything is gone. So, the first basis and the primary basis of assurance is the person of Jesus. The fact that he's deity. The fact that he's God. That is why such erroneous doctrines like Jehovah's wickedness, sorry, witnesses, are not just bad, they are evil. Because if you can afford the deity of the man of Calvary, the Christianity comes to rubbles. The very first thing is that I know that Jesus Christ is God. I know that Jesus Christ is God that became a man. John 1, 1, the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, when we study the deity of Jesus, and we are digging ourselves, we are burying ourselves there, what are we doing? We are further assuring ourselves of the things that we have thus believed. So, the first and the primary truth is the person of Jesus. It's called the Word of God. Hebrews 4 and 12. Revelation 19, 13. It's called the Word of God. It's God made manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3 and 16. So, it's very vital. Whether I'm teaching others, or I'm further assuring myself to, you know, revisit these truths again and again. Deity of Jesus. God, they can felt it. That everything, everything about Christianity is built on the deity of Jesus. On the fact that Jesus is God. Everything about Christianity. So when some people, uh, a man in fantasy came up on television and said Jesus was not there. I said, does he know the implication of what he's saying? You must have a limit to where you take some things. This is too high. You should control his diet. Because this is madness. You can, in, in no basis. <laughs> because the deity of the man of Calvary is the crux of Christianity. Remove deity from Jesus, and then what we have is a mere man trying to follow God. But thanks be unto God. He is God made manifest in the flesh. That is why when it, came, when it comes to the humanity of Jesus' deity, the, I, I was studying from uh, uh, ancient materials a couple of weeks back. And I saw that they were very careful 
on the way they transmitted those words. They were, because you, you have to be careful. They use the right words. You cannot, you, you can't even use a transposition. It has to be an incarnation. You have to be very careful. Because it is the very crux of Christianity. I remember somebody was talking on TV. You know, these guys are just all about, uh, all about seven steps to success. And he says, some people say Jesus is God. Some people say he's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They hear that for the theologians. My own is that God wants to put food on your table. He was saying it like this. My friend was there, Pastor Rotten, and I was saying, ah, is this guy okay? And definitely was not okay. Because you could see the crowd. They were saying, hey, hey, hey. They are just as stupid. How can we frivolously say that? The very basis of... That is... You know, if, I can, if you can prove to me that Jesus is not God, I won't mind. Everything is great. It has to be God to be sinless. It has to be God to die for my sins. It has to be God for that resurrection to be the crown of the redemptive sacrifice. It has to be God. The very person of Jesus. The very person of Jesus. Being God is an assurance of salvation. Secondly, is work. Is work. The ransom that he paid is my assurance of salvation. You know, his ransom is only qualified by his person. Are you following me? His work becomes fruitless if his person is not that effective. The ransom he paid. First John 2 2, the propitiation for our sins, not only us, but for the whole world. That's propitiation. Hebrews 9 15, 12 to 15, an eternal redemption. First Corinthians 6 20, bought with the price. Acts 20 28, bought with the blood of his own. <laughs> that assures me of my salvation. The price that you pay. Once and for all, into all eternity. Thirdly, not in other priority now, the written word. The written word. You know, I'm one of the proponents, and for years, and I'll continue, to keep warning people against frivolously handling the written word. You know, people say, well, it's not about, in fact, some very careless guy. You say, this is Logos. That, in fact, somebody said this, said, Logos is dry. He said, Logos is just a written word. He says, it's dry. He says, uh, the letter killeth, the Logos killeth. He said, the Logos killeth. He said, but the Spirit. You, you can know the Logos, but the Spirit of the world. Okay, what is the spirit of the world? Say the, the, the new spirit of the world. When you catch the spirit of the world. It's a charismatic madness. No charismatic, anything. When we hear spirit, we lose our mind. Spirit. 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 Okay, that's all. Spirit. The written word must never. Because this is all we have. This is all we have. The written word assures me. Second Timothy 3.15 Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures from the youth, from the youth, which are able to make thee wise. No, that's assurance. Even unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things have I written unto you that you may know. Every, all the oracles of God, all of God's revelation were put down in a written form. Why would God write? Why would God ask men to write and give it to us? Is to assure us. So the written word gives us assurance. The written word. The written word. If people can, if people actually, you know, it's the written word that is bailing us out from Sister Clara or what's that? Oh, okay. Margaret. The written word bails us out of the man like we but leave them. That when in heaven, as I see all sorts, for the Christ says it must be childhood fantasy. I agree. The written word build us out of men who have been to heaven and hell severally and come back with all sorts of gory details. The written word builds us out of men who already have the roll call of men going to heaven. 
the written word has bailed us out severally, and it will yet bail us out again. Because let to some men, certain glorified men, so I glorified them above what is written. A man will just get up and in a name of, of untouchability, like we will talk, he says, the Holy Spirit told me, or God told me, or Jesus told me, or, or an angel told me. And I tell people often times, most strange religions in the world started by one spectacular appearance. One angel one dog spoke to them, one goat, a fish would just be speaking to them, and then they'll be writing down. I remember a sister, you know, more much years ago. She just was writing. She would just sit down one and write. She'd be writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. So I had heard about her when I having a meeting. She now brought one of those scribbled writings, like tables of stone, and brought it near me. I said, who is this? <laughs> said, the Lord said, I am the Lord. I told her, and I changed not. <laughs> she ran away. We had to deliver her from the power of darkness. The written word that delivered us. Imagine people coming up to tell us, Jesus said this. Thank God for the written word. And I tell people, look, the Bible was not written in Holy Ghost language. It's a human language. So say, I know what I'm saying. That's okay. When the Bible says, for God so loved the world, what does it mean? Give me the hidden meaning. <laughs> What's the hidden meaning? What's the rema there? That the gave only word. That word, the rema there, actually means it is the word that gave. So the written word will bail you out. That's the essence of eminotic. It will bail you out of confusion. How many of you have seen us build out? You see, just, see, just put it in context. It's not difficult. It will build you out and further assure you. I told you, when I was against the security years ago, I was so angry. So, see, I said, don't mess with you. Don't mess with you. So, I think I'm just ripping this. The, but that was a long time. I should have stopped ripping by now. <laughs> very, very long time. <laughs> This thing is. There must be something I don't understand. So I get, I went to get some very nice versions. I checked them. This one didn't help me. Hosanna, forever, eternal. It must not be the meaning of the spirit. The spirit is saying something else. I know the spirit can. Can the spirit say that? I say for the spirit cannot be saying something like that. You know. So, but the written word will build you out. When you read it again, it will be the same thing. <laughs> Do you understand? And that is, that is the beauty of being, it being written. Imagine if the God, word of God was passed out by MP4. And they now say, you tell him. You tell her. So we are now telling ourselves what God said. You know what will happen? One day we just say we are all Muslims. <laughs> uh, what God said last night. You know, what he told you, he said, I should tell you this. And then they'll be gone. But everything is written. So that it can be read. So that it can be understood. Written to be read. Right? So before you start praying for revelation, read first. Imagine praying for revelation, no meditation, no study. You confuse yourself. You'll be hearing voices. So the written word gives us assurance. Number four, our faith. I have believed. John 5, 24. He that believes will not come to condemnation. John 3, 16. He that believes has eternal life. Has everlasting life. John 3, 36. He that believes will not be condemned, will not come to condemnation. John 3, 36. He will, he will have, he has everlasting life. John 3 36. Hebrews 4 3. We that believe we have entered into rest. What's the rest? Salvation. Salvation. Romans 10 8. What saith it? The word is mighty, even in the heart and in thy mouth. These things are not just for preaching, no. They are for you. To further retell yourself 
of the things you have most assuredly believed. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he was buried and raised the third day according to the scriptures. I am saved. How? Read. How? I have believed it. I am saved. Also, we have the witness of the Spirit. Romans 8.15 The Spirit bearing witness with our Spirit, verse 16, that we are the sons of God. We have received not the Spirit of bondage again to fear, verse 15, but the Spirit of adoption. Hereby we cry, Habba Father. Romans 8, 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It should be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man has not the Spirit of God, or if you, if the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Christ being you, verse 10. Then the, the, the body is dead to, to sin, and the Spirit is life for righteousness. Also, there is a witness of your own life. You are saved. Look at how Peter puts it. In Second Peter 1, we've read that before. So living right also helps in the assurance of your salvation. Just living right. Because one of the things that create doubts is the condemnation of the enemy. And when a believer is not living right, it will create doubt. There is no amount of revelation that you can have about that security. If you are not living right, it will create sin consciousness in your mind. There is nothing you can do about it. If you are not born again, it will create... So, a man by living right... Look at that second Peter again. Second Peter 1. Verse 4. He says, he has given us exceedingly great oppression of promises, hereby by this we might be partaken of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. So he says, we have already escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. However, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. Temperance, patience. Patience, godliness. Godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kind charity. Notice everything he's mentioning here is in your conduct amongst people. So he now says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be you shall never be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord. No. So what what we say I'm fruitful we are referring to salvation? Huh? What? Works. That means your works, you know, will abound. He that lacks this thing is blind. I cannot see a vow and has forgotten that he was purged from his whole sins. So he's already purged. The only thing that he has, he has not retained it in his mind. So he's saying that these things from verse 5 to verse 8 and 9, they are born again, the sins are purged, but he says, This man has forgotten. So what does he say? He says, Wherefore the rather. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you shall not stumble. For you so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, you see, he's saying there's a subjective assurance of salvation. When you are acting on the word. When he says there's brotherly kindness, there's virtue, there's diligence, he mentions, you know, brotherly kindness, he mentions patience, he mentions temperance, they further help the journey as a believer, the assurance of salvation. So, there's a subjective work, there's your responsibility, you must fellowship with the word of God, just like you have come today, it's part of, that's part of the work. Yeah, further hearing God's word again and again and again and again, assuring you of your salvation. It helps the way you relate with the Father. It helps the way you relate with other believers as well. And in fact, it also helps the way you relate with the devil. Things that undermine this assurance, things that can affect our assurance, don't forget, assurance salvation is subject. Can't be subjective, sorry. Sin or sin consciousness. Sin or sin consciousness. First John two one and two. 
says, I write unto you, little children, for John 2 12, that you know that your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And what we have studied so far in Hebrews 6, 6 to 9, you know, it shows you again that by living right, you know, a believer, by living right, walking in the word, walking in the light, walking in the spirit, believer further assures himself of salvation. Because naturally, in life's issues, as life's issues happen, things create doubts in our minds. Our will is still functional. Our minds are still there. You see, just like John the Baptist, you know, he began to wonder, ah, I mean, life circumstances, he was in jail, and he was about to be beheaded, and then doubts crept into his mind. But as long as we fellowship around these troops, I mean, we know Jesus, keep hearing about Jesus, and that's why, as a preacher of the gospel, as a believer who listens to preachers, the true test of a doctrine and your ministry is how much of Jesus you speak about. If you speak about Jesus well enough, people will be fully convinced about what he has done. I'm talking about believers. Talk about Jesus well enough. The true test of the teaching is, what does he tell people about Jesus? Because I'm going to show you some moment, you know, life's issues can undermine the assurance of salvation, just like John. And most of the time, like I mentioned to you, I told that guy on Facebook, we've forgotten that the world is evil, is in the hands of an evil person. First John 5, 19. The whole world lies in the wicked one. That's what the Bible says. John 16, 33. In this world, there are tribulations and trials. In me, you will have peace. So clear. Whatever is born of God has overcome the world. First John 5, 4. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. You know? You look at the different things, you know, that has happened to mankind from Genesis 3.14 down calamities, Genesis 8.22. None of them caused by God, even in the hearts of men. You know, you find out so much has happened since Adam's transgression, such that the Bible repeatedly calls the devil the prince of this world, the god of this world, the ruler of this age. So those things on their own, they can create doubts, creep. The doubts will just creep into the mind of a believing one. But as often as he fellowships on the written word that unveils the person of Jesus, is further assured of the salvation that he has in Christ Jesus, his relationship with God, his relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Also, doubts about scripture. Be careful as a believer of reading materials that create doubts. I don't know what a Christian is doing with Watchtower. What are you doing with Watchtower? I, ju- I just like reading this. You are not okay. So you watch Tower. What are you doing with Watchtower? You know, things that create doubts. Islam, for instance, wants to false, it wants to, uh, how do I put it, falsify the claims of Christianity. Hinduism. You know, I was checking the word karma. Karma is um, taken from the Hindus. And I checked the word karma. The word karma is an Hindu word. It's taken from the word karma. It actually means works. I find Christians saying it's love karma. A believer. Subtly in his mind, he believes in karma. Then Hindu, it's actually supposed to be like the practice of an Hindu god. So I love karma. I remember somebody was saying this. I said, Ma, he posted it on his Facebook page. He said, Mahatma Gandhi said, I love Christ, but not Christians. He said, if Christians can be like Christ, the whole world will change. And the guy who are well, like him, people are always on, well, I just like us. That's who they are. They, will, they have nothing. They don't think. And I, I called the guy out. Because I know him, I called him out. You know what he called him out? I said, so he's liking Christ. What did he now do? Did Christ ask him to like him? Does he believe he is God? No. 
was an Hindu man. Does he believe Jesus is the Son of God? No. So what did he like about Christ? His teaching. When you have two clothes, give it to one person. I said, is that salvation? I said, no, but mm -mm, there's no sense in what you posted. Right? There's no sense in what you posted. Salvation through faith that is in Christ. Whether you like Christians or don't like, you'll be like a rich man. You'll be there. And then the ones you don't like, the Lazaruses, they will be in Abraham's bosom. And you were born. Guys say, eh, well, well I'm, mm, there's nothing you are saying. Don't create doubts in people's minds. By the time you are using Mahatma Gandhi quotes to rebuke Christians, something is wrong with you. Use Paul's quote. Sufficient quotes are by Paul, Peter. In fact, if you need more, James. James will give you sufficient. <laughs> I rather even have you use Moses. <laughs> that Matt, a what? Very so confidently. It's just uh, I that catch us. <laughs> so everyone will be quoting Muhammad. <laughs> yes, now. I see someone called Muhammad Ali. That's too much philosopher, not the boxer in the service. I just closed my Bible, it was 97, and I just left the service. I said, What more can we say there to this thing? You know, I changed the time. It, it, it does this by here. I just leave. I don't stay here. There's no separate words. You know what I say? Why are you leaving? I said, what am I staying for? <laughs> <laughs> to hear the remaining nonsense. There was one who was written one day, and it was, I just took, took my money. I said, I will never give up in this place. And I went upstairs. It was a church. I went upstairs to buy Coke and snacks. Someone said, I would rather not destroy the temple of the Holy Ghost that doctrine. I will keep taking care <laughs> of the temple of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm a much more gentle character now. I've added these things to my faith. <laughs> Over the years. <laughs> because, man, I, didn't, I, I was not a good person at all. <laughs> you know, and I'll say it to your face. It's not that I'll say it behind you. I say, I didn't give up in your service. You know why? They're preaching nonsense. We're not preaching Jesus Christ. So be careful of, you know, things that create doubts in your mind. Don't, there's no point fellowship around those things. So I told me, have you read this? I said, have you read the Bible? Have you, read, have, you read, have you read the Bible? Do you read the Bible first? Before you start reading all the reading books. You know, a book can read other books for 10 hours, but the Bible is boring. So, be careful of materials that put doubts about Scripture. In these days of Google, you know Google? Can Google you out of the faith? Say Google. And you are Googling yourself into perdition. Also, doctrinal errors can create doubts. And I can see this. For instance, what is usually called Calvinism and Reformed error is a doctrine, Reformed theology is a doctrinal error that is so, 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 I don't, I don't know how to put it again. And those kind of errors, they make Christians doubt so many things. You know. Look at the issue of unpardonable sin. I remember a church in Lagos here. A friend of mine was a pastor of their fellowship. So a brother, I don't know what the brother, I forgot what he said the brother did. So as he was going back to the church office to be apologizing to the man of God, I heard his skin was changing to green. And the guy said, ah, that the pastor said he could not help him again. I said, why? He said, because he has committed your pardonable sin. I was in the office and I began to laugh. So I was funny. Emoji. I said, who committed it? <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, the guy said, for you to say that your GM means the thing is pardonable. <laughs> Both of you, <laughs> you know. But look at that. The guy was really afraid of sickness, and from the wrong teaching, he thought that God was just saying, look, look, don't come again. And God just visited him with change of skin color and, you know, bleached his skin. Uh, and, you know, the guy was going to die. And he felt that that was what God was going to do to an unpardonable sin. Which is funny. So he kept going back to the past. But I don't want to say, I don't want to say, unpardonable sin, unpardonable sin. And they all believe it. You know, imagine what is in the minds of new converts when they hear that. Eh, it's an unpardonable sin. That I, can I commit it? I say, for you to, for a preacher said, for you to 
say, can I commit it means you cannot commit it. What's that? What did you just say? For you to be saying, can I commit it? That means you cannot commit it. I said, is, is that the answer? You know, we just say things and, you know, and he's a respected person, so I don't want to mention the name. I said, what's that? What's the, for you to say, you can, you can, that means you cannot commit it. What if I can? You know? Do you understand? So, we that in Matthew 12, 31, 32, Jesus meant, if you just took the, what he said within the context of what he said and bring it in the overall context of the scripture, you understand basically it, it could never have be been a believer. I was referring to. In no way and manner. So, false doctrines, doctrinal errors create on bad emotion. For instance, people that associate things with don't wear, uh, you know, there was a time body of Christ said, if you devil is in a box, I remember then, he said, we should not watch TV. It was difficult for me, but me, I used to watch board, and I'll go and watch it. He said, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. They are now live streaming all over the world. You can imagine, all over the world. So I said, no, they didn't say, they, I said, were you born again then? I was a fellowship coordinator. You understand? I've gone for home. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so doctrinal errors create doubts. Doctrinal errors create doubts. And also when you have strange visions and revelations. Be very careful. Strange visions and revelations. Be very, very careful. I was talking about the Robert Lairdon one earlier on. You know, he said he saw body pass in heaven. People's arms that were caught, legs, tongue, eyes. Uh, maybe he went to that place in the bathroom. <laughs> <Boy, man. laughs> because I can't imagine what he was trying to say. So I said, but it's not, it's not possible. Flesh and blood. I not inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> Don't you understand? <laughs> you know? How did I be myself out? The written word. So if you like, close your eyes and be saying the vision. Now open my eyes. Because I need to read what you are saying. <laughs> you know, a man once preached and said that, that God opened the window of heaven. He was in a crusade. He was overwhelmed by the crowd. He said, Paul was watching. He said, Abraham was watching. And they were excited. What is that? <laughs> and then he went to Hebrews 12. When he quoted Hebrews 12, verse 1, I said, ah. I zeroed on this one years ago. You know this man is on that level. I can't say Hebrews 12. We are surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. Is it not clear what we are surrounded with? Hebrews 11, 1 to 40. That's the cloud. He said they were surrounded, that they were looking at them, and they, that Paul is in this meeting. I, you know the people, they always shout, you know? There was one service I attended in 99, I think. The way they were shouting in that audience, the person that took me, I said, can I go? He said, aren't you enjoying it? I said, no. I said, can I go? I said, there is no sanity in this place. How can somebody be talking? In normal palace, somebody is talking and you are shouting. He said, hey, ha, hey, hey, hey. Is either you are dramatizing something or what he's saying is not serious enough. That's the plane. And I left. And I said outside until they finish the service. Because you know, we don't know when the Son of Man can come. He <laughs> 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 can come any time and any day. So, be careful for false doctrine. It can affect you. It can. It can affect you. He has time. Someone says, you wear, wear, he has time. You will wear. You can imagine what happened to me years back when I was told that disco is of the devil. You no know disco. Oh. You know, everything is now disco. Disco. Kadudu. Kadudu. I wanted to ask a question about fellowship there, but the guy, but Bonlani, he beats drums. He said, no. That's not Dudu. Kadudu. That's. <laughs> they explained it to me, and I said, So that's not to be candidate. <laughs> so, 
So when you hear, when you say someone is rapping, I just say ra, no, ra, you know. So so many things, you know. What is all that? You, you get it. You know, Paul was writing about me to to hide on. That's one problem. You should come to this time. He was talking about Robo eight and always meet. Ah, uh, that's the problem you were facing. Pastor Paul, come to this time. You see all sort of thing. Whether you should wear a ring or not wear a ring. Whether you should wear gold rings. You know, so, what is all this? Whether jeans is of God. Whether bell bottom. Whether how can you reduce Christianity to all those kind of things? Whether you should wear belts or don't wear belts. Whether you should wear tie or don't wear tie. Uh, makeup. Is it of God? Is it of the devil? Uh, hairstyle. Which one is of God? Uh, is, uh, uh, when you do this one. Uh, so if somebody here now has all white. White skin is saved. <laughs> As if he was bathed with Amatan. He said, And once all his is fine, he's going to hell. Ah! What kind of. That's how one. One from brothers in a particular church. They have to complain to their pastor that every time they get home and their, their wives will move the thing, the whole place is smelling. That they should, they should, have, they should please to the teacher so that they can open their hair and have, you know. I said it so fast so that you will not succeed thinking I want to know. <laughs> you know, very same things. So one doctrine is bad though. One doctrine is very, very, it does more harm than good. I'm telling you, it does more harm than good. At the end of the day, you begin to doubt the written word. You're going to create doubt in your mind. Yes, time. Yes, time. Salvation. So in those days, when I was in secondary school as a Christian. When I'm, when, when I'm at home, I put on court. When I'm going to school, I just clean the thing back for salvation purposes. <laughs> you know? So what are the people that used to bring to us? We now went to university. We now came out with air court. <laughs> So this is everything. <laughs> so when we leave the world, that's where we we'll get into. Mm, it's very important that you don't believe false doctrine. Amen. You don't be, don't believe false doctrine. And some people say, uh, you know, they say he saw a, a, a redeemed camp. There was one angel in a white bus, and then he came down. He said, "See that place? Two thousand people will not make it, and they made it an issue." Something that we used to have comedy. They would say, we have a, I, I now have a script for a comedy in church. What is it about? Say, an angel came down from a bus. He said, for an angel. This one is not an angel. It's not a real angel. It's not even falling. It's not even rising. Because <laughs> that's your brain. <laughs> at what point do you count 2,000? Before now, after now, at what point do we count? Do we count 2,000? Before they start, the second day of the camp, the third day of the camp, or when the camp is over, or later this year, there must be a point we will count the 2,000. Or at the gate. What about those who live at a point? You know, it just doesn't, that angel has no brain. So, doctrinal errors, for instance, and ignorance of eternal security always creates doubt. And if you want to see believers who are the least assured of their salvation, believers who doubt the doctrine of eternal security, they are never sure. But I'll tell you the truth. A lot of those who teach against eternal security in their minds, they are thanking God for it. I told one, if the sergeant was not eternal security, you, with the nonsense you are preaching, you, you will not, they will create another hell for you. And that's the plain truth. And I'm not joking. So, John 28, Jesus was very specific. He says, he that believes, he gives them eternal life, and they will never perish. So, the believer has a responsibility to guard his heart, guard his mind with the truth of God's word, and Paul's admonition, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Prove for your own selves. Don't allow anybody to do that for you. Prove for your own selves whether you are in the faith. Don't allow anybody to be, know you not your own selves, how the Christ, Jesus Christ is in you, except to be reprobate. You, ah, you should know now. You should know. You should, there should be your own Act your own part to it where you know these things yourself. You know that Jesus Christ is in you. So prove it for your own selves. You must do that for yourself. That's why Paul will write several times 
Know you not what is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's expecting you to know these fundamental things. You know, these are, these are, I say it, you know, in closing. Some of these things people say about salvation, they are too fundamental, too basic. They are not even the major issues, as it were. I mean, so Christ died for you, they are saved forever. Those are not, those are not issues that you should be debating. They were never issues in the first 1,000 years of the church. About one thousand. They were never, it wasn't a debate. It was not a debate. It was not, it was not part of a controversial issue at all in almost, I think, about four, four, first 1,000 years of the church. No, 600 years, pardon me, of the church. It was never a debate. It was never an issue. It was never, nobody was trying to ask, you know, who, 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 can you lose salvation? It was not an issue. Anywhere, at any point. It came up during the advent of the Catholic Church. So it's when the works salvation was now reintroduced into Christian doctrine and then the issues of how saved are you, how long are you saved came up. And of course many denominations that came up since then, they've had a bit of you know, a bit of two from that particular error. So that's why we are having issues where we shouldn't have issues. Rather than go on into growth, we are still doubting whether what Christ has done is part once and for all, whether it's what we do that is once and for all, or you know, and so on and so forth. So this is a very important issue in salvation. You to personally be assured of the things that Christ has done for you. It goes beyond belonging to a church. That way, some people belong to a church, and when they leave that church, they start believing the truth of God's word they are taught there. It's actually madness. It's your, it's, there has to be a personal appraisal of these truths, you know, to assure yourself. Assure yourself. And like Paul said to Timothy, you know of whom you have believed. You know. You should know it yourself. From a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ. Thank you. God bless you.